Hello and welcome to the Full-Time Creator Podcast, where you'll get wisdom, tips, and inspiration from creators building their dream businesses. I'm your host, Zach Swinehart, and today's guest is me. I don't know if you know this, but I have been in the internet marketing space since I was a teenager. My first online business was when I was 13, and I was teaching people how to make hemp jewelry like macrame on YouTube. And I still remember how freaking cool it felt when I woke up one day and realized someone in like Greece bought some hemp jewelry supplies from me. <laughs> I think I spent like 70 euros shipping it to them for something they paid like 80 bucks for, uh, but it was still really cool. And in the years since, I have been working in the internet marketing, web design, conversion rate optimization space. I've built conversion-oriented websites for, at this point, hundreds of clients, and I've worked with big names like Entrepreneur on Fire, Amy Porterfield, Rick Mulready, Jonathan Fields, Ryan Lee, and more over the course of these past 13 years that I've been doing it professionally. I also run my own six-figure business as a course creator, and I've managed over a million dollars in launches for clients start to finish from the very top of the funnel, like writing content, all the way through to lead generation, creating opt-in forms, lead magnets, running conversion rate optimization on them, and building out email automation and doing launch campaign strategy and copywriting. The last launch I fully managed for a client beat her historical average by over 10%, and that was the launch after a price hike campaign. So I was basically competing against the previous launch where it was like, hey, last chance to get in before we raise the price by 30%. So that's never a fun uphill battle to fight. And uh, I say all this to give you the pimped up intro that I would normally give to a guest, not to just toot my own horn. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about top of funnel conversions, aka opt-in forms, lead magnets. I heard someone call it a quote, carrot recently, uh, whatever you want to call it. The opt-in forms that I've built for clients have easily generated over 100,000 email subscribers for them and for myself. Uh, and in my experience, this topic is the easiest and most neglected low-hanging fruit for email list growth. Uh, a lot of people put their attention on content, social media, things like that, where you, you already got the low-hanging fruit wins, and now it's kind of like this game of you know compounding consistency, that kind of thing. Um, but with no exaggeration, the stuff we're going to talk about today could literally and often does double your email list growth rate overnight with like an hour or 30 minutes or 20 minutes of work. So in my opinion, if you're making the four mistakes that I'll be talking about in a minute, this is like probably the biggest impact thing you could implement in your business right now. So today's episode... We're basically going to first dive into a quick, like rapid fire of what the four big conversion mistakes are that I see with course creators in general, with past clients. And then we're going to do a deep dive into each. And I'll walk you through the strategy and process that I use to literally 7x the email list growth for one of my clients uh, and for many others, like doubled it pretty dang easily. So we'll go through all that. And uh, it's going to be a fun, maybe intense episode. It might be the classic thing where I'm like, oh, yeah, sure. This is like, you know, 40 minutes of content. Fast forward six hours later, I'm still talking. So we'll see how it goes. <clears throat> if you want to build on what you're learning today and actually implement it uh, and probably double your email list growth rate overnight, I made a free little mini course that you can implement within 30 minutes that walk you through the exact steps for creating and launching high converting uh, opt-in forms and lead magnets. They're the exact steps that I use for myself and clients. And I've got a bunch of like templates, swipe copy, that sort of thing. So that it's just like a really fast, really quick win. My target is to have you implementing this within 30 minutes. Uh, so if you want to download that, totally free. It's at crowiz.co forward slash go. C-R-O-W-I-Z dot C-O forward slash G-O. So it's like, see, conversion rate optimization wizard. Anyway, I don't know if I like the domain yet, but I had to pick it to record this. So let's dive in. We'll start with a quick overview of the four biggest conversion mistakes I see course creators making. And as I said, we'll do a deep dive into each in the rest of the episode. Mistake number one, 
not having a full page, full screen exit pop-up opt-in. So if you just have an opt-in, let's say at the top of your homepage, but you don't actually have like a full page interruptive, annoying pop-up, that's like an easy growth doubler on its own. Um, sometimes people do have a big pop-up, but it's like super duper weak. So let's say you had a big pop-up that was like, hey, join my newsletter. That's also a huge opportunity. So we'll dive into that more, but that's mistake number one. Mistake number two, not having a lead magnet at all. So if you just have something that's like join my newsletter or get podcast episode updates or whatever equivalent, huge missed opportunity. Mistake number three, having a lead magnet and maybe a full page pop up, but having crappy, non-compelling copy and imagery. This was the situation with a client of mine who I ended up 7xing their email list growth rate from their opt-in form. It was just, I think, maybe 10 A-B tests that I kind of lazily, gradually ran to get that 7x. Uh, so if you have a really non-compelling opt-in right now, very easy, low-hanging fruit way to double your lead flow. With very minimal effort and testing, usually my full-page pop-ups get to like 25 to 3% opt-in rate. So if your tool that you're using now, assuming you have a full screen pop-up, shows you your stats and those stats are under 1%, I bet you could you could very easily double. Mistake number four, not performing super simple, slow, lazy, 80-20 A-B tests, at least until you hit a good baseline. You don't have to go super nerdy. You don't have to go crazy about metrics and analytics and stuff, but just running some very simple A-B tests can be the kinds of things where you invest 20 minutes three times or six times. So like two hours over the course of your year, to literally double or triple or quadruple, or in the case of one of my clients, 7x your email list growth. And obviously, seven times as many people come into your email list is often seven times as many people becoming customers. So very huge impact from this stuff. If you're making any of these mistakes, you will definitely love the little mini course and templates I created. It's at crowiz.co slash go. You can follow along with me as we do this. Basically, I'll be walking you through my exact process that I use for creating high converting opt-in forms for my clients. And I also have swipe copy, template, and scorecards so that you can basically just pull it up and in the easiest, fastest way possible, get your opt-ins like converting way better. Uh, I tried to make it so that even if you're a terrible designer, you suck at tech and you hate math and numbers and conversions that you could still just like follow along, do the things, copy and paste, and it'll just freaking work. It won't be, you know, the best, but if you have nothing right now, I can guarantee you it'll be better than what you have now. Uh, and the whole thing about like doubling your email list, it is not BS. And this is why I'm so pushy about this because I see it time and time again, and it blows my freaking mind how few people do this. So if you take nothing else away from today, take away this. Set up a freaking full page pop up with a non crappy lead magnet and opt in form, and you will like get way better results than you're getting now if you're making these four mistakes. So let's do a little bit more of a deep dive on all of these. If you want to download the thing, it is crowiz.co forward slash go. And if you're super busy and you want me to just like tell you what to do or do it for you, I'm sure I'll give you an opportunity to do that. So, so. Just do it, get started, actually do this stuff. Don't just listen to today's episode, actually do it. I don't care if you download anything, I don't care if you do anything else, just freaking do it. So let's talk about what makes a good lead magnet, because that's the foundation that everything else today is going to build on. So the biggest missed opportunity that I see in this whole lead magnet realm is the old sign up for my newsletter, sign up for podcast updates. Sign up for me to vaguely email you about something unspecified in the future. Like it's that's the least compelling thing you could do. It's better than nothing, um, but it's worth worse than like pretty much everything else. And I think if you're just getting started, you don't have an email list yet, that kind of thing. Fine. I think it's perfectly reasonable to have that because, as I say, it's better than nothing. When I launched the full time creator website, and frankly, at the moment of this recording. The full-time creator podcast website still has a generic ass opt-in for like, hey, you get new episode updates and Zach's top takeaways. That's like my way of trying to make it more tangible. Um, but it's still very non-compelling. It's not a lead magnet, but 
when you don't have traffic, it doesn't matter if your lead magnet converts at 75%, 75% of just a few people is still not a lot of people. But assuming you actually get traffic, and let's say, let's define that as what? I don't know, like, let's say a thousand visitors to your website a month. This is me pulling it out of my butt, so I'd want to think more about it. But, um, you know, more than basically zero, then I think that's when it's worth really thinking about having a good lead magnet. And a good lead magnet really is like a long lasting business asset. I have a client, the one I've mentioned in other parts of this, uh, that I 7X'd their opt-in rate and email list growth for. In her case, she's had the same lead magnet since like 2017 or something. To be honest, it is very much due for an update. But nonetheless, like email list still grows. She still delivers value to it. So she still builds new relationships with it. So having a good lead magnet will serve you for years to come. So let's define what exactly a good lead magnet is, in my opinion. So I think a good lead magnet is, number one, quick transformation. Should be fast to consume and fast to implement and get a quick win from. That's like one criteria. Uh, getting closer to the dream outcome easily. So if your audience member wants to, I don't know, I guess in my case, right, you're a course creator, you want to sell more courses and grow your email list. So I need to illustrate how my thing can help you do that. Uh, or it needs to make it clear how somebody can avoid a scary, bad, painful thing easily. Like, I don't know, if you don't do these three steps for GDPR that take like five minutes to do, you could lose all this money when you get fined, something like that. Uh, it should be valuable. It should be simple. And there should be a specific expectation of what you'll get when you sign up for it. This is partly the responsibility of the lead magnet, partly the responsibility of the opt-in form. So it kind of applies to both, but the lead magnet itself does apply. And we'll go into that in a second. Uh, and then lastly, it shouldn't feel too hard or not relevant for me, or it worked for you, but I won't be able to figure it out because I'm not smart enough or experienced enough or whatever, whatever, whatever. It should feel like it would work for anyone who's in your target audience. So to make these a little bit more uh, rooted in reality, let's run them through a couple of examples. So all those things above are in the lead magnet checklist at crowiz.co forward slash go. So what I'm going to do, this is really meta, I am going to run my CRO Wiz mini course through the checklist from the CRO Wiz mini course. <laughs> and fun behind the scenes thing is like in the process of deciding what my lead magnet was going to be today and creating these checklists, I actually honed the lead magnet by running it through its own checklists. It's very, I feel like this is very meta. I'm not even following it. But anyway, let's run it through it, right? So again, the pitch, which is a sneaky way of me reminding you what you get if you opt in, is that you essentially get a free video walkthrough. You get a checklist, you get swipe copy, and you get a template. And then the promise is that you can leverage these things to get the shortcut to have your opt-ins perhaps doubling within 30 minutes. That's basically the quote pitch. So let's run it through the criteria. Is it fast to consume? Yes, I think 30 minutes is fast. I've heard others like uh, Zach Buckler from last week's episode. He targets 15 minutes. Um, but this, I think 30 minutes, like 30 minutes is the fastest I would feel comfortable promising. Uh, 15, maybe I personally could do that since I do this stuff all the time, but I think it'd be tough for a student to do that. So I would give this maybe a seven out of 10. Quick win, yeah, sure. I would say so because you can get a really nice result within like an hour. I think that counts as a quick win for sure. Closer to dream outcome? Yes. Very easy for a course creator to see that growing their email list like, you know, is good for their goals. Valuable? Yes. Simple. Mm, hopefully. <laughs> you you tell me, right? It's hard for me to be objective here, but I think it's relatively simple. You know, you get templates for a lead magnet, you make a lead magnet. I think that's relatively simple. I do tend to make things overcomplicated, and I will be in my top of funnel ads split testing this lead magnet I just told you to download against simpler ones. So what I'll probably play with, for example, is a lead magnet that is like literally only the checklist. 
a lead magnet that is literally only the four mistakes, a lead magnet that is literally only a case study, and I'll see what converts better. Um, but I just want to really over deliver on value more than keep things unnecessarily simple. Because I recently downloaded a lead magnet that was like a PDF and it was freaking useless. Uh, and it just didn't leave a good taste in my mouth. So I'd rather have something more punch. Specific expectation of what you'll get. I would say yes, but this one could be better. This is the problem with the kind of like quote scope creep for this lead magnet. It's like, okay, so am I getting templates? Am I getting a course? Like what, what actually is it? So this one, maybe seven out of 10. And is it doable? Yes. And this is the one that actually made me hone the offer a little bit. When I rated it through this, I was like, you know, I want to make it really clear that even if you're not a web designer, a developer, even if you suck at numbers, you can do this. So I added that to my pitch. And obviously that quote pitch, again, that's something that's like more on the standpoint of the opt-in form more so than the lead magnet. But the part that is inherent to the lead magnet is the format of delivery. So when you say something like, hey, you can download some chat GPD prompts, or you can use some swipe copy, or you can use a template. These things help people understand that it's not up to them being a good copywriter or it's not up to them being a good designer because they have these like just copy paste assets. Uh, and so now let's use these same criteria to rate something like join my newsletter to get newsletters, <laughs> the classic crappy one. Is that fast to consume? Uh, I guess maybe it's hard to say. Is it a quick win? No. Does it get me closer to my dream outcome? Kind of unclear. Is it valuable? Kind of depends on the person. I would say not really. It's not sexy. It might be valuable, but it's not sexy. Is it simple? Sure, I guess, in that you know you're going to just get some emails, but you don't really know what those emails are going to be. Uh, and is there a specific expectation of what you get? No. You're just going to get some emails about this general topic. And is it like doable by a pleb? Unknown. And so you can try, if you are having just an email newsletter, you can try to tweak these different variables. And there are, there's like a whole culture around curated newsletters and stuff like that. Like there are a lot of people who their whole thing is a really valuable newsletter. Um, but in this case, me approaching it as like the newsletter or the, the email thingy as a lead magnet to get you on the list and provide a specific tangible piece of value. In my experience, join the newsletter is always way less compelling than a specific lead magnet. So the question that all this leads to <clears throat> is how do you decide on a good lead magnet? In my mind, the simplest way to do it is, if possible, directly talk to somebody in your audience. I have um, an audience avatar template, which I'll try to remember to include in the free lead magnet thingy. Um, but basically, like, to me, the easiest way to determine what a good lead magnet is, is to have an actual conversation with someone in your audience, ideally like live on the phone. So if you do coaching calls or something, that's a perfect context to do it, to find out what their big goals are and their big pains. And to be really careful about auditing the things you want to help people with versus the thing they actually want help with. And if I'm super honest, my lead magnet is not the strongest from there. I know from being in this space for long enough that like, most course creators don't really care about conversions, at least not nearly as much as they create, care about getting traffic. It's like the classic thing, you know, everyone wants more traffic. I think that, that that's like a timeless thing. Everyone will want more traffic. Every like freelancer will want more clients, but people don't necessarily think about how can I sell more stuff to the same clients? How can I improve conversions along the funnel? That kind of thing. There's that old expression of like, sell them what they want, give them what they need. So this whole thing, this hypothesis of mine is like, can someone who's listening to a podcast episode of mine or watching a video or seeing an ad, can they be convinced that it is worth their time to prioritize conversions? I don't know. It's a theory. Uh, so for deciding on a good lead magnet, basically talk to people, find out what they actually care about. You can spy on them like, you know, in public places like Reddit, your community, your Facebook page, your comments, whatever, to see what people are complaining about, to get an idea what the pains are. Um, and that, to me, informs what the lead magnet could be. You basically want to help somebody either move away from their pains or move towards their goals in a specific, small, tangible, easy way uh, that ideally gives a quick win. A few examples off the top of my head of like types of lead magnets. 
are case study walkthroughs. I've heard that works really well. I haven't personally done one yet, but I'll be testing one when I run ads for this content that I'm shooting now. Chat GPT, GPT prompts. Haven't personally tested this yet, but I have heard from multiple sources from Jordan a couple episodes ago on the podcast and Zach a couple or last episode on the podcast that chat GPT prompts are working really, really well. And it makes sense, right? Chat GPT prompts sounds like a very fast, easy win because all you do is like copy and paste a thing and you get an outcome. Uh, a free email course. I really like this one. It's a little bit less like easy, quick win, but it's what we do at DYF, uh, which is a diff different business that I'm in. And um, the nice thing about the free email course is that it allows you to deliver value on like a multi-touch point basis and cultivate more of a relationship. So even though it's not like the quick win, it's still easy and like bite-sized and still gives us an outcome and then gives you kind of more of a relationship. So I'm still in including that here. Uh, worksheet checklist scorecard. I mentioned already, I feel, I feel like these are maybe a little too small, but but I need to check that, right? Because like, if it's a perfectly positioned checklist or perfectly positioned worksheet, maybe it's fine. I recently downloaded though somebody's free PDF thingy where like, I don't know, I just, it was like three or four pages and I felt like I just read a really long ad and I didn't actually get any actionable takeaways or any new information or like fucking anything from it. And I felt, I felt like a waste of my time. And I certainly didn't want to buy anything from that person because getting such a shitty thing from my email address makes me wonder like, okay, how good is the thing that I would pay for? Uh, other types, calculators, spreadsheets, tools, things where you can like leverage a system or automation to get the result. And that kind of applies to all of these. When you can, you, the course creator, content creator person can invest a big chunk of your time to build a system that allows somebody to then just like, you know, like imagine you built a slot machine, but slot machine is not a good example, but all they have to do is pull the lever and now it just does the thing. You had to spend, you know, like 50 hours building the slot machine now the lever. And again, slot machine is a bad example because it's a freaking slot machine. We want something like, okay, let's say you built a slot machine that hit the 777 every time. That's a better metaphor, um, but you get what I'm saying. Anything where you can invest a bunch of time up front to save the uh, subscriber time later versus if they had to build that tool or manually do what the tool does is a big win. Other things would be automation. So suppose that you could create like a Notion database that does some stuff or a Zapier template where they can just like dupe the template and then load it up in their own business. It's a great example. Uh, swipe files. Again, like suppose you're teaching a certain email marketing strategy and you're like, yo, just copy and paste these emails. I tell you the timings. I tell you what to say and you just change them to match your product. Like that sounds way easier than deciding what an email campaign would be. Uh, workshop recording I'm including, but with an asterisk, which I think it was from Zach. Zach was saying that at least with Facebook ads, uh, workshops, live workshops aren't quite as compelling. And it kind of makes sense, right? Because it's like, if we're looking at this specificity quick win thing, like a workshop sounds kind of hard. It sounds like I'm going to school and I have to sit through this thing to maybe get a result. Uh, so I think that's probably why, if I were to guess, probably why workshops aren't working quite as well as like, I don't know, a specific length of video that gives you a specific outcome. So let's say like, I don't know, 25 minute loom video of me doing a thing live, I think would maybe be more compelling. This is just a theory. You can test it if you want, uh, be more compelling than like, Hey, live workshop where Zach does a thing. Uh, so these are just some ideas to get your brain going. This is by no means comprehensive or the only way to do it, just to give you some ideas. Again, you should, when you're going through this, I recommend you run it through the scorecard criteria that I mentioned and ran things through a few minutes ago, because uh, that's the best way in my mind to validate these things. And if you think there are other criteria that should be on the list, add them. Uh, if you want to download that scorecard template and all the other stuff, as you guessed, I was going to ask you to do it. Uh, you can download all that at crowiz.co forward slash go, and that'll have the scorecard template uh, so that you can just, you know, build your own lead magnet, score it, hone it, that sort of thing, just like I did. Alrighty, so now that you know how to create a thing that people will want to sign up for, you need to know how to position it because the most awesome lead magnet in the world that is poorly positioned is not going to convert. So the classic mistake here is like, download my free ebook. 
that's like the most awful one, right? You can even say the name of the ebook. Uh, the second most awful one would be called like, download my free ebook, uh, seven steps to better opt-ins or something. That's like a little bit better, but it's not amazing. Um, a good opt-in form makes it really clear how the lead magnet will solve the problems of the user. It's not about the lead magnet itself. It's about the like dreams that you move them towards or the pains that you move them away from. And this is something that I often have to remind myself of with like launch copy and stuff like that. It's really easy for me to zoom in on how awesome the product is and talk about the features of the product rather than talking about what somebody actually cares about, which is what exactly it does for them. So basically the goals that you push somebody towards and the pains that you solve are the what, and the lead magnet is the how. So I want you to keep that in mind as you're planning what a good opt-in form is, because a good opt-in form speaks to those goals and pains, and then it basically substantiates the promise uh, with the lead magnet. So the headline says, hey, here's a big-ass goal that you're going to get to, or hey, here's a big-ass pain you're going to solve. And then the subheader or body text is like, and here's how. You'll do it with the help of this lead magnet. So in the case of the crowiz.co forward slash go thing, it's essentially saying, hey, here's how you can double your email list growth overnight. And it just so happens the way you're going to double your email list growth overnight is there's this free course, these templates, the swipe copy, et cetera. Uh, but the main focus needs to be on the double your email list growth overnight, especially if you're in a situation like mine where your actual thing may not be highly valued. Earlier, we spoke about how like in the course creator space, for example, the thing that hands down everybody wants is get more traffic, right? So if I were teaching you how to get more traffic, I could just say like, yo, here are five things that I bet you're not doing to get more traffic. And you'd probably want it because it just so happens that me talking about the product very closely aligns with your own goals and belief systems. But for something where it might not, like let's say I was talking about GDPR compliance, right? Like no one wants to be GDPR compliant, but plenty of us don't want to get charged $50,000 in fines, right? So in a case like that, you would need to really speak to the pain and then your lead magnet and the GDPR compliance is the how. Um, so the headline would probably be something like three things course creators do that like could expose them to $50,000 in fines or something better than that because it's not very good. Uh, and then the subheader would say like, here's this guy that talks about GDPR compliance and whatnot, um, or a calculator or whatever. So all of that said, let's talk about how I would score an opt-in form. And in a little bit, we'll be talking about like A-B tests and like my kind of 80-20 lazy A-B test. And basically this scorecard that we're about to talk about is what drives potential tests. You essentially say, where is my opt-in weakest per these criteria? And what should I test that seems better? So things in the scorecard, seven steps. Does the headline speak to the dream outcome or the pain? Does the subhead or body copy explain the how and basically back up the claim made by the headline? Is there social proof somewhere? In the opt-in form that can be number of subscribers testimonial the amount of years you've been in business the revenue you've generated clients as you've served accolades or awards or whatever recognizable faces or logos who you've worked with or published on or whatever those are all examples of social proof um is it short and easy to read is it skimmable so like bold italics bullet points highlighted text, different colors, things like that. Is there a clear call to action? Something that's like literally saying, do this to get the thing. Uh, and is there risk mitigation? So like the classic one that I drop on pretty much everything. I don't have data to back it. I've never bothered to do an A-B test with and without, but I just kind of feel like it's good. Uh, is something like, quote, no spam, period. Easily unsubscribe anytime, period. Other ones I've seen are like one one click, easy unsubscribe, stuff like that. Like basically, you just want to make it clear. I'm not going to sell your info. I'm not going to spam you. And if you don't like my shit, you can just get out really easily. 
And then what I would count as like bonus points in this scorecard is, um, is there an eye-catching image? It's not necessary. That client who I said I 7 x for, that didn't have an image. It had a background image, but it didn't have like a product image. Uh, that one was literally just text in an opt-in form on a pretty background, and that got up to 6%, which in my mind is quite good for a pop-up opt-in. But nonetheless, images are good. Uh, so something that like depicts what they're signing up for, like a product image, uh, or a person using it, or a person who had the dream outcome, if you're doing like a testimonial-oriented opt-in, uh, is a great way to go for the image. So uh, let's do a little template. This is like my easy 80-20 lazy opt-in template. And if you're in that crwiz.co slash go mini course, you'll notice that this template I'm about to talk about is like the exact one I have in there. Uh, so for the very beginning, uh, one that's kind of experimental, I heard it from Alex Ramosi, I haven't tested it yet, is a small pre-header that basically says, attention, avatar name. So if I was doing it on mine, it'd be like, attention course creators. That would be very small, right above the headline. Uh, and then the headline is essentially speaking to the dream outcome. And I'll show you a, a reference and a couple examples later on. Uh, but yeah, headline speaks to the dream outcome that you're going to move towards or the painful, scary thing that you're moving away from. Ideally, it has some sort of specific number or sexy metric to back the claim up. So like if you can, like for example, if mine says like, here's three steps to double your email list growth rate, or what I did for a client to 7x their growth rate, it's a lot more compelling than something that doesn't have that specificity. Something like, hey, do this to grow your email list. Like it's just, it's vague, you know, specificity is always better. Uh, subhead is, as I said, how the lead magnet gets you there. So this free mini course and templates allow you to get your forms converting it twice as much within 30 minutes. Uh, and then the call to action text, simple. It's just drop your email below to get it. You'll get instant access. Uh, and then the opt-in form itself is the next part of the template. If you have it be email only, it will convert higher than if you ask for first name and email. So it's worth considering. I don't have good metrics off the top of my head of how it impacts conversions, but I know that it does. And then, uh, as I mentioned in that scorecard, uh, the risk mitigation thing. So like no spam, easily unsubscribe anytime. And then lastly, peppering social proof somewhere in the above. So common example would be, and I'll show you it in the example in a minute, but common example would be like join... 523,412 subscribers or a bunch of five-star reviews or whatever, like just showing that other people have done this before and liked it and that this isn't like them gambling on you. It's essentially just lowering the trust required. A couple references from the advertising world that I think are good considerations for opt-in forms because an ad and an opt-in form kind of are the same thing. Uh, so Zach Buckler from the last full-time creator episode, his format for an ad is essentially this. Hook, question, authority, content, call to action, sign off. Uh, so some of those things could be relevant for a lead magnet, for an opt-in form. Uh, Alex Hormozzi ad structure is essentially call out, value, retain. So for him, he has the call out as the thing that hooks and gets attention. So he defines these as like labels, yes questions, if then statements, implied yes questions. Uh, value is like <clears throat> the actual meat that is valuable and educates and shows them what's possible. And then the retaining part is just the call to action. So like if you enjoyed this, you'll love this thing, sign up for it. So those are a couple of references that might inform how you go about this. <clears throat> now that we've got a good understanding for what makes a nice lead magnet and a compelling opt-in, let's talk about the generally lowest hanging fruit thing that I see on client sites and course creators in general for doubling email list growth rate, which is full page opt-in pop-ups. So we've all seen these. Generally, we think of them as annoying and frustrating, maybe. Uh, but in my experience, they are usually the lowest hanging fruit, easiest way to double email list growth rate, and the forms themselves themselves are usually the highest traffic forms on the site. 
Uh, so they're the most effective way to test copy, test lead magnets, test everything, uh, and the best way to get subscribers. The second best is homepage above the fold. Usually, the in the end, the homepage above the fold lead magnet and opt-in form and stuff will pretty much exactly mirror the pop-up. Sometimes if I've got like two winners that I like, maybe I like to present them differently so that I present it one way here, one way here, but uh, in general, they're going to be very similar. In my mind, every website should have both of those areas for sure. The full page pop-up, home page above the fold lead magnet area. And then the third, probably most important, arguably, area would be the end of a blog post. <clears throat> it's the lowest volume. Usually, you won't get nearly as many opt-ins there, but uh, it's the highest intent. Because if someone's read your whole blog post and they join the list, like you know, they like your stuff. So it's good to do this one, but in my experience, it's not as high of impact. So unless you get like a bunch of traffic, you probably won't get really fast results from it, and you certainly won't have a basis for actually doing any testing to see what's really working. It's just a nice to have. So let's talk about full page opt-in pop-ups because I do believe they're usually the lowest hanging fruit, just from what I've seen. Uh, in terms of the how, I personally am WordPress guy. If you're a WordPress guy, uh, I like, or WordPress gal, or WordPress non-binary person, I really like Thrive Leads uh, because you can quickly A-B test things like really, really easily. And I think um, that coupled with it being easy to design in makes it a no-brainer for me. But the tool you use doesn't really matter. Uh, I like Optin Monster for non-WordPress stuff. I used to use lead pages back in the day, and there are about like a million others. Tool really doesn't matter. The main KPIs for the tool, in my mind, are drag and drop, and easy to run A/B tests, and easy to see your metrics. Easy to know like what amount of people who see the form are actually signing up. Those are kind of the things that matter most. So when I build these out, I'll usually go for like a seven or fourteen day cookie on them. So. Once someone sees it once and installs a cookie and it doesn't show it to them again for however long you set it for. So like doesn't show it again for a week or 14 days or whatever. Uh, I always also make sure to enable exit intent. So what that means is like, let's say someone loads your homepage and they see the opt-in form. They dismiss it. They read your site for a minute. They go up to click the little X button. When they go up there to click it, the opt-in pops up again. That's exit intent. Uh, some people like to set it to solely exit intent. I don't because like the obvious reason, right? If you're waiting until someone's leaving and you're not showing it to them until then, you're like kind of waiting until they've decided that your shit's not valuable to try to get them to sign up. I would rather show it earlier. What I'd really rather do is something that isn't really supported by any of these plugins, which is like kind of intelligently show it to them based on variables. So maybe the first time they pull up the site, I show it after a few seconds are showed immediately. And then as they browse the site, I show it again after they've browsed a page for a little while and like gotten to a certain checkpoint. But none of the plugins that I've ever used are that smart. You either can say, show it immediately and add this delayed cookie or show it after a certain amount of seconds. But you can't say like, show it immediately and then show it after a certain amount of seconds. So maybe one day I'll custom code some stuff, but the rapid deployment beats the customizability in my mind. Um, so the structure for what it should actually say in this big ass pop up just follows the format of what we covered in the what makes a good opt in form section. One note is that when I say full page exit pop up, I or not exit pop up, just full page pop up, what I mean is like literally full page. I've tested before against the kinds that are, you know, like this much of the screen, like just what you call a normal pop up versus the one that's like actually the full screen or the one uh, that I use for one of my clients. Thrive Leads calls it a scroll mat, I think. And what that one does is it's not actually really a pop-up. What it does is it injects some HTML at the top and shoves the rest of your page down. And then when you skip it, it like scrolls the page down versus being an actual pop-up. Uh, the main thing that we're getting at here is like it needs to be obtrusive AF. <laughs> like you need to really, really notice it. And uh, the other aspect is it has to kind of like less closely resemble an intrusive ad. I said obtrusive a minute ago. I don't know if that's a real word, obtrusive, intrusive. But anyway, you get what I'm getting at. Um, if it's just like a regular pop-up within the page, like number one, it's easier to 
see how to dismiss it like as a gut reaction uh, versus one where you have to click the down arrow, you have to click the no thanks, I'm not interested. Like it just makes your brain work a little more versus mindlessly dismissing it. I think that's why they work better. One common argument against these that I just want to cover is usually quality. Like somebody would say, well, if someone signs up for something like this, the leads are lower quality uh, than if they sign up for something that requires higher intent. And I agree. Uh, but here's the thing. I would rather have more low quality leads than fewer high quality leads. Because if you increase friction so much that only people with the highest intent can join, yes, your email list will be very high intent and very highly engaged. But I personally believe that in the process of doing this, there will be some people who'd be very great lifelong customers, big fans, whatever, who just didn't happen to get over that friction threshold and thus never ever got on your list. So I would personally much rather have like an automated list scrubbing campaign to purge unengaged subscribers versus like losing an opportunity to get in touch with someone who I might be able to help. That's just my opinion. I think that there's a line that you draw. Like I remember back in the day when Groupon first launched. Do you remember Groupon? Uh, if you don't, I don't know how to describe it. It's, it's kind of what it sounds like. You have to buy a bunch of things and you get a discount, whatever, whatever, whatever. Uh, but basically when they first launched, you could not get into their website without filling a full page pop up with an email. Like it was literally their whole website was gated. Uh, I don't think I would go that far because those would just be like the shittiest leads, right? I think having something where it is dismissible and they only really have to join the thing if they actually want it, I think that that's cool. Uh, so with, with this, before we jump to a couple case studies and examples of these full page pop ups, uh, I want to drop a couple considerations. So one of the examples I'll show you is for a client of mine called uh, Afford Anything. Her name is Paula. She's the one who I 7x the email list growth rate for. One consideration to be thinking about with hers and with your own business is that in my mind, relevant and profitable leads uh, is the focus, more so than more leads. And you'll see how it becomes relevant for her. Uh, so I won't get into it now, but just be imagining like, who is your best customer? What do they care about? And when you are planning what a good lead magnet would be or a good opt-in form would be, it's better to attract fewer of like the people who are really aligned with who a good customer is than more people, but who care about stuff that isn't really consistent with what your customers care about. So don't only go after vanity metrics, also go after like qualitative stuff. And you can make qualitative stuff quantitative if you want to get into tracking like customer lifetime values and stuff. But the whole thing here is like lazy 80 20. And I'm not going to tell you to track LTVs of your different opt in forms to see how they compare. So for now, just qualitatively say, like, what do my best customers care about? Who's the kind of person I want to serve? What do they care about? What are their pains? What are their goals? And make sure that the opt in forms speak to those. Even if the conversion rates might be lower, than speaking to something vague. We'll get into it in a minute. Uh, another consideration is that specificity and relevance to content is important. If you've ever heard of a content upgrade, quote, quote, it's essentially like a lead magnet that is highly relevant to a specific blog post or whatever. Um, but the problem with like really high specificity is that the like sphere of relevance for your website is narrow. And so that is to say, if you have a content upgrade, the idea is that it's so relevant to the blog post that the person's reading that they'd be crazy not to sign up for it. And so people have seen like 20, 30, 40% sign up rates for their, their content upgrades. Uh, but the catch is that you have to make a fucking lead magnet for every single blog post you write. Uh, and so there's this big trade off, especially if you have a lower traffic site. So you have to kind of Look at it from the standpoint of like leverage for your time relative to the amount of traffic you get. So if we're going the Zach 80-20 lazy put something up in 30 minutes kind of approach, I wouldn't worry too much about high specificity. I'd more say, okay, what's the thing we can show to everyone on the site that is like written to speak to our ideal customer uh, and just kind of test that versus trying to get super specific. The next tier is that if you have like kind of three avatars, and let's say you have three big blog categories. Uh, I see this on one of my client sites, Millennial Money Man. He has one category that's like budgeting. 
one category that is side hustling and one category that is like, I don't remember the other category. It's been a while. Uh, so he has like a side hustle lead magnet that shows in that whole blog quarter category. Uh, and then he has like the budgeting lead magnet. So that's that's another way to go that allows you to still get more leverage than crazy specific. All right. So I want to show you a couple of case studies of how powerful these big ass pop-ups can be. So first one is a business that I run and partner in called Double Your Freelancing. Let me pull up my screen here. Uh, so here are some metrics. So basically, I joined into this business late last year and basically been in the process of like resurrecting the business, bringing our courses back online, improving the opt-ins, that kind of thing. And <clears throat> I went through and grabbed some historic data. And for the past like year and a half uh, before I joined, the average subscribers per month uh, before rolling out a pop-up were about 61 subscribers per month. Some months were higher, some were lower. I cut out some of the like uh, event-based jumps. So like since I joined, for example, we did a Black Friday promotion, which always has a big jump because people buy and they use different email addresses. So it seems like you're getting more subscribers, but you're not really. I think that's what this one is here. No, this is March. I don't know what this one is, but we can discount this one. Um, the main thing is, on average, before I did this exit intent or this full page pop-up, I wish I didn't keep calling it S intent, um, full page pop-up, we're on average getting 61 subscribers per month. So if you are just listening to the audio of this, basically just imagine kind of a line that's low, <laughs> a line that's low and flat. And then after I rolled up the, or rolled out the pop-up, our average jumped pretty much immediately to 206 per month, which is over a 3x increase. We can remove some of this to maybe account for like, I don't know, email promotions or whatever, uh, and call it like, I don't know, 120, 150. But like either way, it was an easy doubling. Uh, so that's one little example of the power of doing this. Like it really can be an overnight thing. Uh, when I when I came in, we had an above the fold pop up, or sorry, an above the fold opt in form on the homepage that wasn't very compelling. And I basically made two changes, which is one made it a little bit more compelling. And in my opinion, it's not even that compelling right now. Planning and shooting this episode made me appreciate that I've been the uh, cobbler with the dirty shoes. So one of the things I'll be doing is recording myself launching a new A/B test for. DYF and for my client Paula, who I'm going to share in a second, uh, and then I'll report back with the findings. Uh, but in any case, that's this one. All right. And next example is that client afford anything came out to about a 7.5x of the leads. So I will share my screen here in Notion. And if you're just on audio, I'll try to explain it. Basically, when I first inherited this website, <clears throat> it was back in like 2018. And I basically just loaded up the forms that she had already made in lead pages. I like built them in Thrive. And I wasn't as good then at like CRO and stuff. And it's been really cool over the years as my copy skills have grown. And, and even lately since doing more ad stuff, like as these skills grow, I get a lot more ideas for things that I should test because the ideas, you know, they stick out to me. I have the context. Uh, but nonetheless, if you're on the screen share, you can see this super uncompelling full page pop up uh, that still got 1.05%. And for those of you on audio, I'm going to read it out to you. So basically, super basic. It was like full screen, blocked everything, had a background video of like a tree moving. Uh, headline said, live better. Subhead said, find out how, dot, dot, dot. No body text, email field, and uh, let's start or nah, nah, I'm good. <clears throat> this form, we ran it for quite a while. It had 257,123 impressions, 2,692 conversions, which comes out to a 1.05 conversion rate, 1.05%. Next crappy one, which we split tested, which, which I'll be talking about later in this episode how I go about running my like lazy A-B tests. And you'll see one of the things is that you need to change something big. And I don't do that here. So <clears throat> this one, the other crappy starting one, the headline says, 
live with freedom. <laughs> By the way, this one had 1.14% in the end. Headline says, live with freedom. Subhead, discover how to escape the nine to five. And by the way, the, the website for Paula, it's affordanything.com. So her whole thing is like essentially, she has a few different facets. And this is what I'll talk about in a minute. She has most of the revenue comes from a real estate course, real estate investing course, specifically for people who want to invest in small single family real estate. But her website teaches a lot more than that. Her website teaches like financial independence. And that's where her podcast is. It's in the financial space. That's where she has her audience and stuff. She did a Netflix documentary that was about like side hustling. So the interesting challenge with Paula's brand is that her and she's, oh, another side note is she's not really that like passionate about talking about real estate anymore, but she's known for it until she makes her money. So she has this difficult thing where like a really large percentage of her audience isn't necessarily in a position to buy the thing she sells that actually makes her money. So it kind of sometimes when we go back to that earlier consideration of like, you know, make sure your opt-in forms and lead magnets are relevant to your ideal customer. It sometimes creates challenging decisions around that, which we'll dive into more in a minute. Uh, but nonetheless, headline, live with freedom, subhead, discover how to escape the nine to five, no body text, just an email field. And then the lead magnet that gets sent is the free escape book PDF, which is what got sent in the previous one as well. This one had 285,755 impressions, 3,248 conversions, which is a 1.14% conversion rate. So that's where we started. And then over the course of like probably years, because I was really lazy about it and it wasn't something I was officially doing, just something I kind of played with, uh, I ran, I think about 10 AB tests. Uh, the winner of all of them, which is even better than the current live one, which I'll also dig into, uh, the winner had a 6.02% conversion rate, which I do. I did a double take. I was like digging into her site today to be like, okay, what are the metrics to talk about on this episode? And I saw 6.02, I was like, what? Like, I feel like that can't be right, you know? So assuming the data is not broken, which I don't, I don't know why it would be, uh, that is way freaking better, 7.5x better. And this one, it is clear when we run it through the uh, the checklist that I talk about for rating a lead magnet, it is clear why it would perform better. Um, but sometimes it's kind of mind-blowing to see how these small changes, especially to things like headlines, or what would appear to be small changes, you know, like, well, it's five words before, it's five words now, they're just different words. It's crazy how these things can have such an impact. So this one, they got 6.2, sorry, 6.02% conversion rate, says, headline, join 70,981 renegades crafting the lives of their dreams. Subhead, get our manifesto escape, which teaches you how to dot, 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 body text. It's uh, four bullet points with little check marks. Uh, first one, define what a good life is to you and live it. Second one, decimate debt and build wealth. Third one, identify and dispel fears and limiting beliefs. Fourth one, get control over your time and retire early. Form fields, just email, lead magnet, same one, the free escape book. And it's worth noting that the free escape book does talk about that stuff. <laughs> so you don't like go in there expecting that and have it not talk about it. That's like what it talks about. And I think I created this because like I went through and read the lead magnet of Paula's. And I was like, oh, that's actually really fucking good. Even if it's old, like it's got some good shit. And then I crafted the, the opt-in form around the benefits that that lead magnet teaches you rather than the ones before, which were like, I guess going for some vague curiosity building or something. I don't know. Uh, but anyway, this one got 50,083 impressions and 3,013 conversions. So obviously this one ran for a lot less long than the others. But what's freaking mind-blowing is that those conversions, 3,013, we scroll back up to the others, it's like the same. So the 1.14% live with freedom, that was 3,248. Live better was 2,692. So we got the same conversions, but with way less traffic. So those early ones, 285,000 people saw it to get the 3,000. The other one, 257,000 people saw it to get the 2,700. Whereas this one, 50,000 people saw it 
to get the 3,000. That's that's the power of this stuff. Um, so if you're here on video, you can see I've got the screenshot here. It's nothing crazy. I mean, like you don't look at it and you're like, oh my God, so much better. I, but you kind of do. It doesn't have to be like mind-blowingly better to convert better. It just has to be more relevant. And when we run it through the scorecard from the mini course, which I've got here on my screen share, um, it becomes clear why it's performing better. So the first thing, which by the way, if you want to follow along, crowiz.co forward slash go, uh, you can download that scorecard. Um, we say, does the headline speak to the dream outcome? Well, this says, join renegades crafting the line of their lives of their dreams. So I'd say, sure. Yeah, that speaks to the dream outcome. It's, in my opinion, still vague. That's something I would test uh, improving. But it's better than live better. That's very freaking vague. And it's better than live with freedom. What does that even mean? Does it mean like try to get American citizenship? I hear they have freedom over there. What does it even mean? <laughs> that was a joke, by the way. Uh, does the subhead slash body copy explain how? It sure as fuck does get our manifesto escape, which teaches you how to do specific, specific, specific. Whereas the other one, it's like discover how to escape the nine to five, but it doesn't tell me how. In fact, discover how to escape the nine to five. That might be a good headline. And then the subheader could be like our ebook escape shows you how like that. That's how that should flow. And then the other one says, find out how dot, dot, dot. That certainly does not show how it only says that maybe later you'll find out. Uh, is there social proof? For mine, yes, there is social proof. For the others, no, there's sure not. There's a zero. Whereas mine says, join a very specific number. And this is important. I think I heard it from Nick Colenda uh, or some somewhere that you shouldn't say join over 70,000 because that sounds like, oh, so they just like made a guess and they just like threw that on there. Uh, and the, if you can just be specific, it's even more compelling. So what I like to do for these is like, Obviously, it's a lot more than 70,981 now, but like when I make the form, I like to go in to convert kit or whatever, look how many subscribers are there, and just take that number, put that on the form, the exact number. Uh, or if for some reason convert kit literally says 70,000 on the dot, maybe I would change it to be different. And from an ethical standpoint, make it smaller. You know, if it was 70,000 on the dot, maybe you'd say change like 69,000. 347 and just send out a really offensive email to get those many people to unsubscribe if you really want to be exactly accurate. Is it short and easy to read? I would say yes. It's kind of on the longer side for an opt-in form, but at least with these like bullet points being what they are and very short, everything's on one line, uh, that makes it pretty easy. The other ones pass this as well. They are extremely short. They are extremely easy to read. Uh, is it skimmable? Sure. I think I could have done a better job with bold callouts, et cetera, but it's still relatively skimmable. And obviously the older ones also are skimmable in that they are so short, you don't need to skim. Is there a clear call to action? Yes. Uh, this could even be more clear for the winner. Like it might say, enter your email below to get our manifesto, for example, um, but it's still pretty clear. And the other ones are pretty clear too, kind of. They could all be more explicit. They could say, enter your email below to find out how. But frankly, that's still not a good call to action because it's so vague. Like, I want to find out how right now, and I want to get the actual thing later. Is there risk mitigation? I think none of these have it. Yeah. So none of these have the no spam, easily unsubscribe thing. So maybe it doesn't matter that much. As I said, I haven't actually done an A-B test on that. I just believe it matters. But what if it doesn't? What if it actually makes things worse? If you test it and you get results, write me and tell me. Uh, and then bonus points, is there an eye-catching image? All of these fail on that one, except maybe the live with freedom, because we've got this video in the background of Paula laughing, but it's like irrelevant. So none of these have that. So you can see like, this is not, in my mind, the perfect opt-in. I launched this at this point, like I think several years ago. Uh, and I see it now and I see a lot of things that I'd like to improve that I will be improving. Um, but nonetheless, it does the kind of, it ticks the minimum boxes to be compelling. And that's really all that you have to do if you want an 80-20 working thing. Like getting from a half percent to a 3% conversion on your pop-up is really, really, really easy. Getting from like, let's say three to five, I would say is medium difficulty. 
and getting from five to like 10. I have never gotten one of these full page pop-ups to 10%. I'm sure it's doable. I don't think I'm an Uber expert at this stuff, but uh, it's much harder. And so if you're at the point where you have like nothing at all, or you have like half percent or 1%, you'll get some easy wins. If you're already at like three or four or 5%, then that's where it gets really important to do these things really well and to test and to validate your assumptions. Because ultimately, these are all guesses and assumptions, and we need to actually test to know what really works. Alrighty, let's now talk about the last mistake, which is not running even the most basic and easy A-B tests. So I've noticed for my clients and myself that it's really easy to push A-B testing aside. I do it too, uh, because it feels kind of like a nice to have, and it also feels complicated and like a big nebulous question mark, um, especially if you think it's going to just make a very small improvement. But I want to paint the picture for you of why this is worth it. And painting this picture reminded me, oh shit, this is super worth it, and I need to do this for myself because I've been lazy lately. So <clears throat> imagine you get three email subscribers a day right now with, let's say, a 30-day subscriber value of $2.50. If you can double your opt-in rate, which if you already have really honed opt-ins, it's not going to be easy to double your opt-in rate. But if you don't have pop-up opt-ins, if you don't have compelling opt-ins, if you don't have a good lead magnet, doubling your opt-in rate is actually pretty easy. Um, so let's say you do double your opt-in rate. Even then, it could feel maybe not worth it because, you know, three email subscribers a day versus six, that's only $7.50 of value extra per day. Uh, but when you multiply that out, you start to see how this really compounds. So 225 bucks a month is what 750 a day is. And obviously that's not really, you know, something to write home about, especially for a big nebulous task. But that comes out to 2,700 bucks a year and $13,500 over the next five years. And a lot of my clients have had pretty much the same opt-ins running for five years, and they still generate a bunch of leads. Um, and the other thing to remember is that this is like a 30-day subscriber value, right? You have this customer on your list forever, or this subscriber on your list forever until they unsubscribe. So the value that they represent is not just this 30-day subscriber value. It's anything they might ever buy from you ever. Uh, and so the question is, is it worth investing an hour, 30 minutes, or whatever to creating an asset that will be worth 2700 bucks this year, 13000 bucks within five years, way more when you consider the other stuff? To me, the answer is like obviously yes. So if you're feeling sold, as you watch me uh, lay out some A-B test options, uh, if you want to put one into place, go to crowiz.co for my free mini course plus swipe copy, plus templates, where I'll basically walk you through getting this first one set up, ideally within a half hour. That's my target. Get you launched and live within a half hour. So <clears throat> let's talk about what to actually change. So tests have to be on big things. Maybe you've heard this before. Um, but even that, it's like it's too vague to be actionable. So I'm going to try to be really specific. Uh, so easy examples of small things that you should not bother testing unless you're like Amazon <laughs> is, you know, button colors, uh, background images don't usually make a gigantic difference, uh, font, anything that's like a small design tweak. Big things, when I say big things, and I'll give you examples, I mean things like changing the whole like type of hook for the headline changing the entire layout for the thing, changing the level of detail, changing what is represented with the actual image, like whether you're representing a product or whether you're like, sorry, the lead magnet. When I say product, I mean lead magnet, or whether you're representing a person who gave a testimonial. Like These are gigantic differences. Whereas if you change a couple words, you're like, oh, what if we say, instead of grow your business, uh, we say explode your business. That I would count as a small thing because you're really you're only just saying the same thing a different way. And that that can make a difference. But in terms of big tests, it's it's fundamentally the same. And earlier, I was talking about um, an A-B test that I ran for a client early on. I'm going to pull this up on my screen share. All right. So for those of you on audio only, I'll try to 
explain these things. But um, but on video, you can see my screen with the notes up in Notion and stuff. So the earliest opt-in forms, which I did not devise for this client, I simply pulled existing ones from lead pages. Um, they, to me, like even though I guess they're kind of different, they're still basically the same. Strategically, they're basically the same. So the two early forms, even though they look different, I would count them as pretty much the same. One says, live better as the headline. Subheader says, find out how, dot, dot, dot. And then <clears throat> had a big video background of like a tree in a park moving around. And then the other one says, headline, live with freedom, different font. Um, subheader says, discover how to escape the nine to five. And then the background is Paula, the client, laughing uh, as a video. So these, uh, you know, they're, one could say these are big changes. The background image is different. The font is different. The headline says different things. Everything is different, Zach. But when you think about them strategically, they're still doing the same thing. They're still basically just vaguely teasing the idea of a better life and that you have to sign up to find out what that is. Uh, whereas if we compare this to what ended up being the winner that converted seven times higher, uh, which you know I still see like opportunities for improvement with, I don't think it's the perfect opt-in form or something. Um, but the one that won, it is way different. So the headline has social proof and specificity. So the headline says, join 70,981 renegades crafting the lives of their dreams. So the headline is still vague and curiosity building. But the biggest difference is that the body copy substantiates a little bit more of what you'll get. So it says, get our manifesto escape, which teaches you how to dot, dot, dot. One, define what a good life is to you and live it. Two, decimate debt and build wealth. Three, identify and dispel fears and limiting beliefs. Four, get control over your time and retire early. So this is a really big change. Uh, and if I wanted to do another really big change to this while preserving what works, it would be probably changing the whole headline. And that would be, so like there's a spectrum, right? Of small change to big change. The biggest change would be going from what you saw above, live with freedom, discover how to skip the nine to five, to what you saw here, which is like all this stuff. But once you establish something that's working, you don't necessarily want to change everything. You want to kind of zoom in on the variables you want to experiment with. So if I were to run an A-B test for this, which I'm going to, um, I would probably zoom in on the headline and experiment with changing it. The, uh, the A-B test that I'll actually run for this client, we're running a different lead magnet right now than the one that this is for. So what I'll probably do is for this other lead magnet, I will probably try to find a way to bring what's worked from this one into that one. Um, but nonetheless, if I were doing an ABB test with this one, I would look at it and I would say, uh, what do I want to see if I can improve? Maybe I change the headline to be a little bit more specific. So instead of living the lives of their dreams, I might say like, what does that actually mean? Is it traveling the world? Is it spending more time with your kids? Is it not having to report to a boss? And I would try to test the specificity to see which one converts better because this rule, specificity converts better. So with that said, Let's dive into a little bit more of like my testing framework because I think it'll be more clear as you see some examples and stuff. Uh, and later, I'll show you an actual um, behind the scenes planning session of me planning what I'm going to do as a new A-B test like strategically for the Afford Anything lead magnet that's currently running. So I'll show you that in a minute. Um, but for now, we've established tests need to be on big things. So the question is how to decide what to test you have two options. One, you can use like my easy six month framework that I made, which I'll tell you in a sec. Or two, you can run your current opt-in form through the opt-in form checklist at crowiz.co forward slash go and devise a test that will test against what's weakest. Um, I think we'll be talking about the checklist here in a second as well. I can do a recap. Um, but basically, the idea is if you pull up that checklist and you pull up your opt-in form and you say, OK, does it have social proof? Does the headline speak to the dream account? Blah, 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 blah. You can say which of these things is weakest and what's a hypothesis I have for how I could make that check mark be represented better in my form. And that's the test. Um, but to make it so you don't even have to devise tests, I have like what I think is a pretty safe six iteration testing framework. So if your site's really, really low traffic, this would not be a six month framework because you might need a test to run for two or three or four months to actually get enough conversions to have any good data. 
So I cuddle six test framework, but if I were doing it for a typical client, I would probably do it as a six month kind of thing. Um, so the way that you um, determine how long a test needs to run, basically we want to get 100 conversions minimum. More is always better. So when I say conversion, if we're running a, an opt-in form, a conversion, quote, quote, would be someone signing up for your lead magnet, like someone actually submitting the opt-in form. Uh, whereas, you know, if we were saying conversion on like a sales page, conversion might be someone entering the cart or it might be someone actually buying the thing. So conversion is different for the context. But in this case, we just care about how many people signed up for the thing. So in order to get 100 conversions, you can essentially extrapolate based on your website traffic and your current conversion rate. So if you have a pop-up opt-in form right now and it's converting at, let's say, 1% and you get 10,000 visitors a month and you want to get 100 conversions to have good data, oh, what, are, what were all the numbers I just said? <laughs> did I say 10,000 visitors a month? I think I did. So 10,000, 1% of 10,000 would be 100. Oh, that's perfect. I just came up with this. This is a perfect example. So in this case, 10,000 visitors a month at 1% conversion rate is 100 uh, opt-ins per month that you're currently getting. Uh, so in your case, you could probably run the test for one month to get OK data. It's not the best. And um, depending on how close the two are, you may or may not feel safe making an actual conclusion. But let's say that you did run it for a month. And your previous form converted at 1%. So it got 50 conversions. And your new form got like 90 or something. <laughs> you would feel very safe saying, OK, yeah, that one's obviously better. Uh, but suppose it was like you know 50 versus 52. That's where it wouldn't necessarily feel safe. So in those cases, you could either run it longer or just kind of mark it as inconclusive and try something else. Um, the general testing approach, though, that you take is that you test one hypothesis, you test one variable, you find the winner, uh, and then you test something against that winner to see if you can improve on the winner. Um, so in a second, I'm going to tell you kind of like my order of testing, because it's, yes, about big changes, like I said before. But in order for it to pass this whole make a test in 20 or 30 minutes kind of thing, it also needs to be optimized for ease. So I think that's a really important thing to keep in mind as you plan your tests. So. Before we dive into that, uh, the last thing I want to say on this testing thing is that something really important when you run an A, B test is remembering to actually come back and look at what happened. So what I would recommend is if you do have an opt-in right now, you can extrapolate how long your test needs to be. Uh, and then when you create it, literally put an event on your calendar to come check in on it and just see which one is the winner. And even if you don't run a new test, at least make the winner be the only one shown. Because when you do an A-B test, the tool is going to basically like dynamically send half of your traffic to one and half to the other. So if there's one that's a clear winner, like double the opt-ins or something, you definitely don't want to keep running the A-B test once you feel confident. Uh, so that would be one thing, is just literally put the event on your calendar. If you don't have a lead magnet at all right now, and you're going to run a or you don't have a pop-up opt-in, for example, and you're going to run an A-B test out of the gate, probably just assume you'll get, gosh, I don't know, like, like I don't know, half half a percent to 1%. I think if you're a good copywriter, like if you have copy experience, you'll probably get 1% out of the gate. If you have copy experience and you know your audience really well and your lead magnet is like really good for what they care about, I think you'll get at least 1% out of the gate. If you're new to all this stuff, it might be closer to a half percent. Uh, so based on that, based on your traffic, that's how you know what to set your Google Calendar event for. So let's talk about the 80-20 lazy, easy testing thing. So there's this quote I've heard by David Ogilvy, which is when you've written your headline, you've spent 80 cents of your dollar. So with that in mind, um, the order that I'll usually take for testing is first start with the easy stuff that is still big. So some of these would be, for example, the same lead magnet. So the actual thing somebody receives is the exact same. Uh, but change the headline to speak to po different potential dream outcomes. And the afford anything example I showed you is a great, great example of this. So what you get when you sign up for her escape ebook is basically an ebook that kind of like teaches the principles of lifestyle design, 
financial independence and like forging your own path. That's kind of what it does. And that's kind of who it's for. But there's so many different ways we could position that. And that's what we're talking about here. So one quote dream outcome that it could speak to is like, hey, quit your job and start a business. Another one is be financially independent. Another one that'd be even more specific is like, have all your bills paid from passive income while you get to travel the world. Another one could be like, I don't know, buy your parents their house so they're taken care of or something. You get what I'm saying? So like these headlines speak to very different dream outcomes, very different people, very different intentions, but they still, if you if you saw that headline, you're like, ooh, that sounds cool. Let me download this thing. You're not going to feel confused. You're not going to be like, what the hell? I, I signed up for a guide on real estate investing and I got this book about living the good life. And that's the the really big important thing here is that there's this concept in advertising called AdSense where you want to make sure that if someone sees an ad uh, and let's say it's like blue and it talks about real estate investing, that when they click to your landing page, the landing page should also be blue and also talk about real estate investing, right? You want it to be pretty consistent. And so when you're experimenting with A-B tests, you want to always make sure that no one is going to sign up for the thing and feel like they got the wrong thing, like feel like you hooked up ConvertKit wrong and sent them the wrong PDF. Um, so that's one good example there. Another one I can give you for different business I'm in is double your freelancing. We have an audience of freelancers and we have a free email car course called Charge What You're Worth, which basically teaches freelancers how to get out of commodity work and basically not be competing on price and do more unique stuff. So the easy, obvious hook for the headline there is like double your rates because everyone wants to double their rates, right? But the other headlines I could test against would be something like uh, get like the get better clients angle because most freelancers like everyone wants more clients, everyone wants higher rates, but people also want more freedom. People also want clients that don't micromanage them. People also want to be respected by their clients. People want to be seen as authoritative. So I would probably want to test headlines that speak to those different things. Uh, as long as somebody who was interested based on a headline that spoke to that thing would still be a good customer and still get value out of the course. Another thing I've got down is uh, in the easy column is keeping the same lead magnet, but articulating the format and delivery differently. So people don't really care uh, whether you are giving them a PDF or an email course or a video or whatever. They do care. It does influence things, but like the main thing that they care about is the transformation they're going to get. So as long as it's not BS, you can articulate the format differently. And what I mean by quote, not BS is like, let's say your thing is a PDF. If you say, hey, get our free video course about how to do this thing, and then you send them PDF, that would be BS. That would that would be confusing. But let's say it's a PDF and you call it an ebook versus a manifesto versus a like guide. And the asterisk here is that changing that word alone probably won't make a big difference as we scroll back to the the rule of change something big. But where it might make a difference is if you call it something like, um, like, let's say, for example, you send a PDF, but you also send a series of emails, like teaching them things, then you could put some emphasis on the fact that it is an email course or a mini course or something like that. Or if it also, in addition to having this PDF includes worksheets and things like that, you could put more emphasis on those things. So that's what I mean by kind of articulating the format and delivery differently. I think on the whole, this one is probably going to be less impactful than the headline and less impactful than the copy on the whole, which we'll talk about in a second, but still want to throw out there in the easy column. And the last one is simple versus detailed copy. So like short form versus long form. So usually the difference here could be, you know, like headline, subhead, one sentence versus headline, subhead, one sentence, several bullet points, and another sentence, something along those lines that can make a big deal. Uh, and changing the content of those bullet points to either speak to outcomes or uh, features of the thing that could be a test run. And then in the medium difficulty column would be a totally different angle and design for the lead magnet. So in this 
case, what I'm thinking of, there's this uh, ad format that I learned from Zach Spuckler, who was on the Full-Time Creator podcast as a guest of mine recently. Uh, let me show you my screen share here. So this is an ad that I'm running right now for that Double Your Freelancing course. So instead of the ad, and I'll, I'll read the ad if you're on audio only, um, but instead of the ad being focused on the email course, it's instead focused on the person. So this ad features Maya, who is somebody uh, that's active in our community, and she's been having great results so far. So she's really nice for testimonials and stuff. Uh, and this ad is basically a photo of Maya, a big quotation mark thingy, and then a very like short-ish testimonial she submitted. So it says, your free email course transformed my business. Since taking it, I have doubled my rates and 4 x my leads. I'm so happy I stumbled upon Double Your Freelancing, and then some emojis, and then Maya and Freelance Designer and Branding Pro. So that's the ad. Like The ad literally doesn't even say anything about join the free email course. It's just literally a testimonial. And I'm testing this against some other things right now. Um, and so when I say do a really big dramatic redesign, this is kind of what I mean. If your previous opt-in form was like, hey, do you want to, you know, join 70? Like I could, well, let me quote the actual one. So if the previous one said, join 70,981 renegades crafting the lives of their dreams, get our manifesto, which teases you how to blah, 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 blah. The gigantic redesign that's testimonial focused might be like literally a big ass quote from somebody that was like, since this is off the cuff, right? Um, since downloading your manifesto, I have quit my job and grown a six-figure business within two months. Obviously, this wouldn't that you wouldn't get such a cool testimonial. But you get what I'm saying. Like, if you have somebody who sent you a really sexy, awesome, quotable testimonial, that could be a really cool headline. And this would be an entirely different angle for the opt-in. So this is in the mid-tier of difficulty. I would recommend exhausting the easy tier first before messing with this. Uh, and then the hard tier would be a totally different lead magnet. Um, I'm currently playing with like a lead magnet stacking strategy, which I'm actually doing from this same recording I'm doing here, uh, which is where in the process of making the core lead magnet, we can make several other like add-on components, which we could test as standalone. So for example, if you go to crowiz.co, forward slash go, the whole lead magnet I've been promoting to you has been like, you get the free video walkthrough and the checklists and the template and the swipe copy. That's what you'll get when you go there. But when I'm running ads and testing opt-in forms, I might test one where it's like only a checklist, or I might test some that's like only chat GPT prompts, or I might test one that's only like a checklist of the big mistakes people make, or these six these six tests that I'm going to be telling you in a second, I'm thinking that would actually be a really cool lead magnet too. It could just be like a checklist of six A-B tests you can run to double your email list growth rate. So it is generally a pain to test different lead magnets because you have to have a different funnel. You have to like you have to do a lot of stuff. Um, but there's that old saying about like you can only polish a turd so much. And if your lead magnet kind of sucks, no matter how compelling your stuff is, it's not going to convert super well. And even if it does convert super well, it's not like you're going to be getting a lot of goodwill if your lead magnet sucks. So final notes on this whole lazy, fast A-B testing stuff. Um, first thing that I just want to be really clear about is that it's best to test it, in my opinion, in the highest traffic area on your website, which is pretty much always going to be the like full page pop-up that just shows everywhere. Uh, second highest traffic would be the top of your homepage. But still, full page pop up is like usually the best way to do A B tests. And then what I like to do is take the winner and roll it out to all of the other areas, like the home page above the fold and other footer areas and stuff. I, I think that there's also an argument to be made for having the home page above the fold one maybe speak to a little bit of a different angle than the pop up one so that you're kind of covering multiple bases of what might resonate with somebody. So you know, do whatever you want there. Um, one other note when you do this is that new lead magnets and new A-B tests and just like new new things generally appear to convert better at first, but over time, performance levels off. Uh, this could be due to 
repeat visitors who are already on your email list opting in for something that they already have, especially if you're like really changing the positioning because they might be like, oh, is this a different thing than what I already got? I don't know. Let me sign up. Um, and other thing could be like whenever you run one of these A-B tests, the pop-up delay cookies get cleared. So if you had one pop-up that already showed and now it's going to be waiting two weeks or whatever to show again, but you start a new A-B test today, it's going to clear out that wait. So you'll get this surge of people seeing it who've already seen it, maybe already opted in, that kind of thing. So make sure you run it long enough. It's, it's not uncommon at all for something to be the air quotes obvious winner. And then as time goes on, it kind of dips below and it ends up becoming the loser. So give it time. Finally, let's talk about the six easy tests you can perform within like 15 or 20 minutes each that I used to 7x my client's opt-ins. And again, if you want to implement these, the training at crowiz.co forward slash go has me literally screen sharing and setting it up. So join that if you haven't already, and I can set these up with you. Um, but step one, you want to establish your baseline. So if you already have a full page opt-in, you've already done this. So congrats, you've already done step one. Um, but basically, if you haven't, uh, what you should do is set up your initial opt-in form. Uh, if you don't have any kind of opt-in form on your site yet, what I would say, use the template in that CTA I keep giving you and use the swipe copy. And it's basically going to be a short form benefits oriented one. Uh, and just keep that running until you get 100 conversions. So if you're low traffic, you'll it'll be running for a while. And while that's running, be collecting concrete wins uh, from your students, especially ones who have used your lead magnet. So if you do coaching, like if you do live coaching, uh, you can straight up ask people on your coaching calls what their experiences have been with blank lead magnet. Like, hey, did you take our free course before you bought the coaching program? They say yes. You're like, what do you think about it? They're like, oh my gosh, it was so great. I took your course about cat grooming and now my cat is beautiful. It was so awesome. And then you can say, cool, can I, can I quote you on that? And then boom, you have an awesome testimonial to use. Uh, so be collecting those kinds of wins. If you don't do live coaching, uh, ask for those wins either in an automatic way in your, your funnel, like as part of the lead magnet fulfillment. So what we do at DYF with the free email course, we send daily emails with like daily worksheets. And then on the final day, we, we ask them like, how did you enjoy it? And they can say, liked it, loved it, didn't care for it, et cetera. And then if they say that they liked it or loved it, we ask if they want to like leave a testimonial, things like that. Uh, you can also ask for it in like a broadcast one-off way. Common thing that works well here is dangling a free coaching call or something where you say basically like, hey, I'd love to hear what you think about stuff. I'm going to raffle off a free one-hour coaching call to a winner at random. That's usually something that's worked well for myself and clients. Test number two that you can run is testing against a different dream outcome or fundamental motivation headline. So in the case of DYF, if right now it says W rates, maybe we would do another one that was like, get clients who respect you. That would be like a different dream outcome. Or for Paula's, if it was like, uh, join the renegades crafting the life of their dreams, we might do one like, quit your job and grow a business. So it's like just a different hook, but it's it's... It's fine. It'll flow into the exact same copy. Test number three, uh, testing against like a super social proof headline. Uh, so for DYF, it might be join um, 24,328 freelancers learning how to double their rates. I've thought about this sometimes with DYF and my objection to it is like, if the whole thing we're doing is we're teaching you how to go from commodity freelancer to consultant, I Maybe I'm too in my head about it, but I'm almost like hesitant to use the join XYZ big ass number because it's almost like, well, shit, if so many freelancers do this, then I'm just like, there's like more competition. Now everyone's doing this or something. I don't know. Maybe I'm being silly about that. So I should ultimately I should just test it, right? Because you don't know until you test it. Uh, so that's what I mean by super social proof headline. Another social proof headline would be just a straight up testimonial. So just like a big ass thing in quotes that was like, this course transformed my business and helped me double my rates versus versus me saying W rates, now a real human is saying it. So once you've run those three, uh, choose the winner and test it against a quote testimonial image. So like that one I talked about earlier with Maya, uh, it would be the exact same opt-in form, 
exact same copy, exact same everything, except you plop in that image that's like someone saying something. I have heard that if you can get a real screenshot of someone saying something on a platform, so like let's say somebody said something in a Facebook group and you took a screenshot and it shows the little Facebook likes and it shows the yesterday at 3 p.m., that's good because it kind of signals authenticity and that you you didn't like make this up because you just took a screenshot and stuff like that. So um, so yeah, so that would be test number four in this simple, easy test process. Just test it, plop the image on, see what happens. Next test to run would be choosing the winner from, I guess, from the first four. So let's say you plopped in that testimonial image and that was the winner. We would then test that one against one with a product image depicting the thing you're getting. So I'll do I'll do some examples of these for like my conversion wizard thing to give different context. But in the case of DYF, you would maybe have one where instead of the picture of Maya leaving the testimonial, the picture would be like a visual representation of what an email course might look like. So I would probably do something where I get those like 3D worksheet images and like make nine of them since it's a nine day email course and make it clear that these are like emails. So like a screenshot of the email and maybe like a little email icon or something like that. Uh, so yeah, so test a product image. If it's a video course, you could get one of those product images where it's like a computer monitor with your video on it, things like that. Uh, so that would be test number five. And then test number six would be choosing whatever the winning thing is so far and testing it against more detailed copy because so far we've just been doing short form. Uh, so I would make it more detailed where I add like a few bullet points or something and maybe a second line or something like that. Uh, so here, here's what I do if I was doing it for conversion wizard. So the baseline and what I will be doing is essentially what I've been doing in this recording, which is I will have a headline that speaks to like double your email list growth rate. Because what I, what I know about course creators from at least from clients I've worked with is that most people don't really care about conversion rate optimization. Most people don't really care about like doing A-B testing. If they cared about it, they would be doing it. But I do know people care about growing their email list. And so if I could say something that speaks to like, you know, grow your email list or have your email list growth rate double overnight, I think that would get attention. So that'd be my headline. And then the how would be like, you know, do, do these three steps within 30 minutes, use the templates, swipe files, video training to do this thing. Uh, so that would be like the baseline test. And then the different dream outcome. I haven't thought about this one yet. What would it be? Different dream outcome, fundamental motivation. So we know that all course creators want to earn more money and get more leads, but no one wants to get more leads. They just want to earn more money and they see getting leads as a way to get there. So I'd say probably something like the cheeky one would be like the easiest way to double your income this year. Maybe I do that. That would be a headline to test. So instead of talking about email list growth as the hypothesis that we could resonate with, I'm just going straight to the meat and talking about the thing I know everyone cares about, which is earn more money. Uh, we could also do a mistake one. So we could say like, if so, this is something Zach Buckler did in his episode. He like he takes a stand and he has a stance. And so his episode on my podcast, the title was something like, if you're not running paid ads to build your email list, you are wasting money. So it's like tension catching and it's kind of contrarian. So maybe I would do something like um, if you, I don't know, if you don't have an exit pop up or sorry, a full screen pop up, you're wasting money or something. I don't know. I would speak something, something to the mistakes probably, or maybe the top three mistakes that cost course creators on average $50,000 a year that you could fix in 30 minutes. It's really long. It's not very good. Uh, social proof headline. This one would be easy. I'd probably grab a quote from Paula. I have one from her where she says like, uh, Zach is the MVP of my launches. He's real good, blah, 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 blah. Maybe I'd do that one. Or maybe I would do one where it's like, learn how we 7 x Paula's email list growth rate overnight. Well, it wasn't overnight, so I wouldn't say overnight. Um, or maybe I'd have her give me a testimony where it's like, Zach is, well, I don't know if it'd be Zach is awesome, but basically get a quote from her saying that these strategies 7x my email list growth rate, something like that. Uh, and then choosing the winner from the three testing gets a testimony image, pretty straightforward, product image, pretty straightforward, uh, and detailed copy. I think what I would do there is I would like, I would just explain 
in a little bit more detail the um, the actual implications and the benefits. So probably I'd say get the free video course, swipe template, sorry, swipe copy templates, etc., um, and they'll help you to dot 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 dot. Uh, I haven't thought about these bullets. Let me think for a second. So I was thinking about it. And the reason it's tough for me to just spout these off the top of my head is that the bullet points I would use would be very dependent on the headline and the copy. So it's hard for me to like hypothetically say what the bullet points would be in step six when I haven't done steps one through five yet. But supposing I did something like, let's say the headline was uh, the, the cost one, right? So the, the three biggest mistakes course creators make that cost them on average $50,000 a year in lost revenue. And then the subhead would probably be something like most course creators don't even have an X or don't even have a full screen pop up and don't even run lazy, easy split tests. This causes them to lose this money because it's not uncommon to like double or triple email list growth rate when you do these things, and email list growth rate equates to revenue. This is really long, by the way. I would never publish something so long. I would spend a lot of time editing this down. Uh, and then the bullet points I would basically, in this framing, probably be something like get the uh, get the free course and templates and whatnot, where you will learn. Uh, then first bullet point would be like the top three lead gen mistakes and how you can fix them. Uh, templates to easily get your first like opt-in form up and running with within 30 minutes. And then maybe something in parentheses that says like this often doubles people's email list growth rate. Uh, and then another one was like maybe maybe something that speaks to the ease, like swipe copy templates, et cetera, so that you can do it even if you suck at tech, suck at design, and hate math and metrics. So maybe I would put that there instead of in the subhead. So obviously, off the top of my head, this is all very raw. When I do this for myself or with clients, I spend a good amount of time thinking about it, reading through a checklist, and just doing it one direction off the top of my head. It doesn't work that well. Uh, but this is the process that I would go through for that. So hopefully, this gives you a lot of context and gives you some ideas for tests you might run on your own things. All right, so before we go, I want to share one last little experimental tip that I've been playing with, which is that you can leverage ads for ideas of things to try on your website's opt-in forms. So I took Zach Buckler's Facebook Ads Bootcamp. Zach Buckler was a guest on my podcast. Uh, and his bootcamp was really cool. It's at theadsbootcamp.com. Uh, and what I'm thinking is kind of cool is that when you run ads, you are getting a much higher volume of traffic on your stuff. But obviously, that traffic's a lot less engaged than the traffic that's on your website. Um, but nonetheless, for testing things like headlines and hooks and what people care about and how to word things, I'm thinking uh, you can kind of use these ads to get insights and get ideas for things to test on the opt-ins. I could see an argument being made that it wouldn't be good data because the type of traffic that's actually on your site would be different. And when you're running ads, especially Facebook ads, you're kind of showing them to a bunch of people and trying to hook people in. So maybe it won't work, but it's still an idea I wanted to float to you to perhaps play with is that if you are running ads, you can test creatives and headlines in your ads and then use your findings to hone the opt-ins on your site because they might inform things to try in A-B tests. So this has been a hefty episode. I was going to do like this behind the scenes planning of an A-B test strategically for a client. And technically, I did do it. But the podcast gods frowned upon me because my mic stopped recording audio and I lost all of it. And I lost it so cleanly, just right here, right where I'm talking now. This is me splicing in. I lost it so cleanly at the end of this section before the next one. I feel like it's a sign. You know, I don't usually look at signs like this, but I feel like it's a sign. And I'm going to lean on that more so than the fact that I'm just bloody exhausted and sick of talking and my voice hurts and we need to end it. So all of that is to say, let's wrap it up. Uh, so my closing thoughts, my classic question, which I did steal from Zach Buckler, is what would you do if you were 10 times braver? So that's a question I'm asking you right now. What would you do if you were 10 times braver? What's the thing you know you want to do, but you're a bit scared to do? Um, for me, the answer to that question today was this episode. 
it's been a bit of a like imposter syndrome milestone to do a solo episode. It's, if you run a podcast, you've probably experienced this yourself. Like, you know, it's one thing to be like, okay, sure, I'm good at asking smart people questions, but it's a whole new milestone to say, okay, do I actually have anything useful to say? If you're still here, I'm guessing the answer is hopefully. <laughs> Certainly, if you enjoyed this, I would appreciate the positive feedback, whether that's leaving a good review or a like or whatever. But frankly, it would be a review because a like, I'm not even going to, I'm not going to know that. Um, but I'm guessing if you're still here, you found this useful. So that was my 10x braver. What's yours? What would you do if you were 10 times braver? Um, with all this said, hopefully you've gotten some good ideas. You have some good strategies to try. Uh, but all these ideas and strategies are useless if you don't actually do any of them. Uh, and that's the thing about A-B testing. It's not an urgent fire. It's not something that's going to cause your business to fail. But it might be the thing that causes your business to be hyper profitable versus kind of profitable or kind of profitable versus just scraping by. I do think it's really important. Uh, and I'm trying to make it as easy as possible for you to actually do it. I really feel like if you just follow my screen share, use the templates, you can get a high converting thing up within an hour. Might not be the half hour that I'm targeting, but certainly within an hour. And I do believe if you're getting traffic and if you're getting email subscribers already, uh, like let's say you're getting at least, I don't know, 40 or 50 email subscribers a month, I do believe that it's worth doing at least something. If you're just starting, you don't even have a lead magnet yet, you don't even have an email list, you don't even have much traffic, I don't think it really is the best place for you to put your time. But if you're getting a little bit of traction, it's like probably the high, highest ROI thing you could do, IMO. Um, so if you want to take action, and if you don't want to just learn these ideas, but you want to actually implement them, I definitely recommend you check out the free course I made you. Uh, it includes screen share of me setting all this up side by side with you. It includes templates, swipe copy, and scorecards. So the idea is that even if you suck at technology, suck at design, and you hate numbers, math, and metrics, you just follow Zach, copy and paste the stuff, and have a high converting opt-in form. It might not be the highest converting opt-in form the world has ever seen, but it will certainly be better than nothing, and it'll probably be better than something that you have now. If you got this far and if you feel like you're committing some of those mistakes, like maybe it's not very targeted, maybe it's kind of vague, it will almost certainly be way better. I don't want to say it'll double because I don't know what your current one is, but if your current one sucks, it'll probably double it. Uh, so if you want to follow along with me, it's totally free. It is at crowiz.co forward slash go. The double your email list growth rate thing is like, it's really, it sounds like BS. Like I feel weird saying it. Like it feels very clickbait. It sounds like BS, but it is, I mean, I've just seen it so much. And I was going through to do some of these like kind of teardowns for my podcast guests. And it's like, gosh, none of my full-time creator guests have pop-up opt-ins. <laughs> I think Zach Buckler at the time of recording, I don't think he even has a lead magnet on his homepage. Like this is such an easy, low-hanging thing, fruit thing to do. And like, it blows my mind that people don't do this because it makes such a gigantic impact. Um, so if you want to calculate if it's worth it for you, like ask yourself, what amount of your sales come from email? What is your current email list growth rate? If that growth rate increased by 50, 100, 200, 300%, what would that mean in terms of dollars in your pocket over the course of the next year or three years or five years? Because these things compound and they stick around for a long time. And it's really easy to just kind of sit by idly and do nothing when you know you might look back in two years and be like, shit, if I had just done this when Zach said, I would have gotten an extra like 20,000 email subscribers. And that would have probably been $100,000 in revenue or whatever your numbers are. So I know I'm being pushy, but I'm only being pushy because I see this so much and I believe it is so, so, so important. And because, you know, I'm promoting my, promoting my own thing, I know it's going to be good and that someone's not going to be like douchey and just like give you some crappy lead magnet and then like sell you, sell you, sell you. I'm just trying to give you a really good training. And if you want to pay me to set this stuff up for you, I'm happy to do it. But even if you want to take just the lead magnet, do it yourself, just freaking do it. So I'll get off my little pushy sales pedestal thing. Um, but if you want to do that, it's at crowiz.co forward slash go. And if you don't, it's been great hanging out with you today. And I will see you on the next one.